I am most importantly Anna's nephew so I'm here to guide you all through the book launch um, what I wanted to do first of all I wanted to pay tribute to the First Nation people of this part of the world but I wanted to do it if I can in a bit of a roundabout way I wanted to talk about what Malik Ravitch could and could not see. Because obviously he was a crazy brave pioneer, this sort of wild, enthusiastic visionary. And he was a trailblazer, I guess, in really, in simple ways that we can understand. Hundreds of people at the Kadima in Carlton, uh, the inspiration, if you didn't know this, for the first Yiddish book published in Australia, for the first Yiddish school in Australia. He was a realist. So he saw things as they were. If you read the book, you'll see that he says this about Melbourne, says this about Melbourne as it was and is. The conversations in Melbourne conducted every day in every house are restricted to two topics, football and horse racing. <laughs> and this also isn't too dissimilar to Melbourne. People here don't walk. Everyone drives everywhere. Almost every family owns a car. And that's in the 30s. But he was, of course, blind to some things. He couldn't see what was right in front of him. There's not much to see in Alice Springs, he wrote. The land is empty in the literal sense of the word. The blacks in Australia cannot be regarded as owners of the land. So there's a lot he's not seeing in that sentence. He also says when he's talking about, of course, if you don't know, that whole trip is to work out whether or not there should be a massive Jewish settlement in the territory that the land need be taken from no one. So it's really easy to look at that and think, right, that's racist and prejudiced, and it is. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about that time, the limitations of that time, and then the limitations that we all face. I don't know how many people here know that the traditional owners of this land are called the Yalakut Willem that they are a clan of the Bunurang, that they are part of the Kulin Nation. What I do know is that most of us know a whole lot of landmarks in Melbourne, and very few of us know that they are places where the Kulin Nation told stories, held ceremonies, and passed on knowledge. We think that the first corroboree recorded by white people took place on the hill that's now where Parliament is in Spring Street. We know that the Yalakut Willem gathered on the hill in South Melbourne that's between Clarendon Street and South Melbourne Market that the South Melbourne Town Hall now sits on. I don't know if most people know that it was Faulkner's ship, the Enterprise, that stopped and anchored at Elwood before it sailed up the Yarra. Most people, when I ask them what's Enterprise Park next to the aquarium, they don't really know that that's where the Enterprise landed and that's the beginning of the white intrusion into Melbourne. <coughs> And I mention, I always try to mention Faulkner ship stopping at Elwood because I used to think Elwood was part of a wetlands. What I've realised just in looking at to talk today, Point Ormond's the remainder of this massive red bluff. There used to be this massive cliff all the way along Elwood Beach. It was taken apart and used to fill in things like Elstonwick Park and Elstonwick Lake. And Elstonwick Lake used to be where as they headed up the coast toward the head of the Yarra, they would stop and that lagoon or billabong was a particularly fertile place to hunt and stop and talk and eat and gather food. So in thinking about what Melek Ravitch saw and did not see, I was actually really stunned to discover something else when I was doing what I always do, I try to make a traditional welcome to country that is relevant to its location. I live in St Kilda and I've lived there since 2002. And I wonder how many of you have, like me, driven past the oldest living thing in Melbourne, hundreds if not thousands of times. If you drive into St Kilda Junction from Albert Park, so from the city heading into you know, St Kilda, 
Up on your right, where Queen's Road sweeps down past the Junction Oval, there's a huge old tree. It is three to 500 years old. It's called the Nagagi Corroboree tree. It's the, the only thing left from a forest that extended through Albert Park and up through and into Paran. So I found myself thinking a little bit differently when I actually went, I went to that tree for the first time this weekend. I've never been there. It's just stuck there on the side of Junction Oval. There was a women's big bash league game going on. I don't think, I mean, no one knows it's there. It's marked. I saw a few nodding heads, so I'm impressed that there are some people here who've got greater knowledge than I am. <coughs> but I wanted to mention one more thing about the local area before I introduce Arnold Zabel and get things underway. And I don't feel like it's my story to tell the stories of the people who are here. So I tried to find the oldest mention of something in this part of the world. There's a guy called Frederick Revens, who's a Supreme Court judge in New Zealand. He arrived in Melbourne in 1854. And he was a little boy in 1857. I remember our excitement when one day, probably in 1857, 200 blacks from Gippsland arrived suddenly in Hotham Street, trooping towards Elstonwick. An hour or two later, a solitary woman appeared and we gave her something to eat. She followed the tracks of the tribe in the dusty road. And when we asked her if she could see her husband's tracks, she pointed them out to us amid hundreds of others and started to follow them at a run, pursuing an irregular course such as he had taken when carelessly strolling with the mob. In the evening, we followed them, hearing they were going to hold a corroboree and found the whole tribe camped at a place where the trees were fairly thick. There were no residences near, save for a house or two along Brighton Road some distance away. I think the spot must have been somewhere not far from where, in later years, Sir Frederick Sargood built his fine house, Ripon Lee Mansion. Here we stayed until midnight, mixing with the blacks, listening to their chants and watching the strange and grave dances of the corroboree circle. I just wanted to mention all that because this story is a remarkable blend of the fantastical and the blind and the visionary, and all of those things have taken place here. There's been a hell of a lot of blindness in this city for a really long time, but there's also been people sitting right here, right near Ripponlea, telling stories, sharing stories, trying to educate each other for tens of thousands of years. So with that, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, past, present and emerging. And I would like to ask Arnold Zabel to come up here and kick off the proceedings for our evening. Where's Arnold? Here we are. Here he is. It's interesting that I was, I hope you can understand me, my voice uh, um, is having problems. But um, I was in New Zealand uh, the last few days and it's interesting to see how they welcome people at big events. First of all, uh, Maori will welcome people in language and not translate. And secondly, when New Zealanders welcome people, they know language and they know it well. They are so far ahead of us. They are so far ahead of us. And we've got a lot of catching up to do. So, I wrote the following words last night on a plane over the Tasman Sea, somehow appropriate to write them while travelling and to write them after an afternoon spent walking the streets of Christchurch, blessedly in freedom with a man who has just spent six and a half years in hell and who, like Ravitch, is a writer, a poet, a journalist, a thinker, an advocate and an image maker, and a lover of his own stateless people, the Kurds, as well as humanity itself, Behus Buchani. Also, appropriate in the light of Anna's poignant introduction to her book, linking Ravitch's quest to the plight of contemporary asylum seekers and refugees, 70 million, as Anna says in the introduction, 70 million people still looking for a place to call home. So this is what I wrote. It's a great pleasure to be asked to take part in the launch of this stunning book. Mazel Tov Anna, you've created and also recreated a work of great beauty. 
Anna, like you, I too have long been haunted by Melech Avich's quest, the tale of a Yiddish poet on the road in a country at the ends of the earth. For me, Ravitch has been a kind of kindred spirit, a long-distance traveller drawn off the beaten track, drawn to continents and oceans, new worlds and ancient pasts, drawn to see the world from the ground, the view from the street, yet also compelled, indeed obsessed, with nailing what he experienced in both image and word, because without this, for Ravitch, the journey and the experience and life itself would feel incomplete. Ravitch's journeys and writings were coloured by a streak of romantic longing, but also with an eye for the surreal and the absurd, all of which can be seen in the photo of a water bag in the carriage of a train with the caption, Australia's problems can be solved in four words, more water, less beer. <laughs> Ravitch was a multifaceted and complex man, a passionate Yiddishist, and passionate lover of his own people, and also a pantheist, drawn to many places and peoples from many lands. And Anna tells the story beautifully. For this launch, Anna asked me to read a couple of Yiddish verses from two of Ravitch's countless poems. The first is from his poem about the Melbourne Cup, in which Ravitch delights in, as Anna says, the foreignness and the recklessness of the Goyesha joys. I'd add that Ravitch couldn't believe there was a country on this earth that, are, that had a holiday for a horse race. Die Orme in Geist, die Reiche in Harz, gebench die, was bringen dem Himmel zu der Erd, gebench die, was stellen sehr Masel weg, auf die göttlich schöne Fies vom Pferd. The poor in spirit, the rich in heart, Blessed are those who bring heaven to earth. Blessed are those who stake their luck on the divinely beautiful feet of the horse. <laughs> In the second poem, Ravitch has his mother mocking her son's Meshuggah quests. As Anna says, Ravitch travelled to nearly 50 countries, living the secular bohemian life, chasing the exotic, all the time also searching for himself. But in this poem, with a single swift movement of a hand, his mother obliterates his whole traveller's persona. I think my mother felt the same about me. <laughs> but what could she do? By the way, my mother came out on the same boat, the Ville d'Amiens, and spoke often of Ravitch's kindness to her as she tried, finally in vain, to find a new home here. Zog di Mame, du meinst, Tacke Emes, was du hast dir eingerät stark, als die Welt ist etwas mehr dort wie unser kleiner Mark? Ot warf ich die sieben Welten durch dem Fenster heraus, ot giss ich die sieben Jammen in dem Kirchschaf los. Ask my mother, do you really think, as you've come so strongly to believe, that there is something more in the world than in our little marketplace? I'll throw the seven worlds to the window away and I'll pour the seven seas into the slop bucket out. Anna also asked me to read this extract from Ravitch's gorgeous story about the completion of his massive book of poetry, Continentum Oceanen, Continents and Oceans, a poetic world atlas about new and unknown worlds. Anna has edited this extract from a translation which I did together with Ravitch's feisty sister, the dancer and choreographer Ruth Bergner, still alive at 103. The story appears in Ravitch's Meister Buch von Mein Leben, the story book of my life. Yossel's sister. Yes, sorry, Yossel's sister. Ravitch is looking back on a moment that took place in 1937. Ravitch writes, at that time, I was living in Melbourne on Royal Parade. On the table lie 10 bundles of poems, Asian, American, African, European, Australian, Oceanic, philosophical and pacifist, vegetarian, <laughs> Jewish and personal poems written within the intimacy of four walls. How truly appropriate that it should be completed on the most distant and loneliest of continents. 
It's two in the morning, and I am overwhelmed by both a feeling of frightful loneliness and boundless joy which I must share with someone. Only a few quiet streets away lives Pinchas Goldhar, the only God-blessed Yiddish storyteller in Australia. He is a man with an artistic soul. He has a heart for another's madness because he too is capable of such deeds. I weave through street after street until there it is, the tiny garden in front of, and in front of Goldhar's weatherboard cottage. And wonder of wonders, a ray of light spreads across the street and in the window is Goldhar's silhouette. Ravitch? Ravitch. It's nothing you can understand. I've only just now, till the very last dot, completed my book of poems, Continents and Oceans. I feel that I had to. I know you'll understand. I just had to show it to someone. If not, I'd go crazy with loneliness. I couldn't wait until morning. I know you can understand. Here it is. The bundle of papers tied firmly lies on the windowsill. Golda embraces and kisses me and he too becomes filled with a strange kind of joy. This whole episode seems to please him immensely. He also perceives that there is something about this nocturnal encounter between Yiddish writers that captures the transcendental, transcendental essence of Yiddish literature. We should celebrate this occasion with a drink. Goldhar creeps quietly into the darkened kitchen and emerges with two beautiful crystal goblets, filled to the brim with fresh tap water, and places them on the windowsill. <laughs> to life, l'chaim. That was perhaps the most wonderful banquet that I've ever taken part in to celebrate a new book. <laughs> Anna, I drink a toast to you now, in celebration of your beautiful new book, in which you have brought back to life the exotic quest of a wandering Jew in search of a homeland for his people and on a deeper level, yes, on a quixotic search for himself. You've done him and his son Yossel proud. L'chaim. Thank you. Um, I've had the story sort of of Malik Ravitch's trip sort of dribbled out to me over the years whenever I've sort of visited Anna and Ray. But I hadn't actually seen the pictures uh, until I got a copy of the book um, soon after we came back from Central Australia. We went for a trip, my family and I, to Uluru. I hadn't been to the centre of Australia. I'd been to the Kimberley. Um, if you haven't been there, of course, it's amazing and mind-blowing. But when I look at these sort of pictures, the thing that I think about is we had a four-wheel drive that was air-conditioned, so at least we had that every day to get into. Each night I'd sort of have a litre, half a, a full litre bottle next to me, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, we were sleeping in tents, and I'd need to drink like half a litre of water. You know, it's just the desert's just so unbelievably intimidating and draining. And quite apart from anything else, the insanity of coming so far and then travelling with that sort of technology is, uh, uh, continues to astound me. It was just interesting, even though I knew the story and then I saw the photos and went, oh my God, that's just crazy. Um, let me introduce Moshe Lang. He is a family therapist, a clinical psychologist and author. Most importantly for tonight, Melek Ravitch's artist son, Yossel Bergner, was his dear friend. And from Moshe, we're going to hear about Yossel. Like Yossel, I don't know when to stop. When I'm given only seven minutes, so when the time is up, you just tell me to stop. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the invite, and thanks for spending time with me and allowing me to remember Yossel. I spent three hours, I think it was, recording stories about Yossel with Anna, and it was just the beginning. Um, In 1990, Yossel arrives in Australia to open this exhibition of the Melech Ravitch trip to the Kimberleys. He travels from Tel Aviv to London. From London, he goes to Melbourne. Melbourne, we join him, and we go to Adelaide. 
by the time we get to Adelaide, Yossel is, is, by then he's 70, he's exhausted, but everybody tells him, Yossel, do not go to sleep. And he fights his uh, jet lag. And then they ring him from the gallery and say, we've organized for you an interview on the radio. And I go with him to the radio interview. He gets to the radio interview, and to his surprise, there are two nuns. They are about to interview him, and the first question they ask him, it's about death and dying. <laughs> and they say to him, what's your opinion of death and dying? And Yossel says, I'm totally against it. <laughs> <laughs> so they take a lot of time to recover, and eventually they ask him a trickier question, to which Yossel says, my late father, the famous Yiddish writer, once observed that we are only dead in the eyes of the living. <laughs> At that point, they gave up, and, uh, and Yossel took over and talked about what he wanted to talk about. And he did a very good job of it. Um, I think it was 91 that the Jewish Museum organized an evening Leah Kaminsky talked about Melech Ravitch and I talked about Yosel. Oh, not precisely. They asked me to talk about Yosel and I said, look, Yosel talks about Yosel much better than I do. Why don't you show the videotape painting the town that Australian television made about him? It's a wonderful uh, videotape. I recommend it to all of you. And I'll just answer questions at the end. But in the best Jewish tradition, the Jewish Museum did not manage to play the tape properly. So in the last minute, I had to talk. And the first thing I said was that Yossel once told me that as a painter, he has had more periods than any woman he has ever known. <laughs> and I commented that further, Yossel, in his 90, he has still not had menopause. <laughs> and he still keeps producing. Um, at the end of the evening, uh, at the end of my talk, people were invited to ask questions. And not one question was asked. Why? Because everybody knew Yossel better than me. <laughs> everybody in the audience was a better friend of Yossel, and I'm sure there are many I know who are better friends of Yossel than me here, and who could tell better stories than me. I then sent the, the tape of it to Yossel, and Yossel liked it very much. But I think probably the thing he liked best was that everybody claimed that uh, he, he, they are his best friend. Um, but talking about periods, um, it's amazing to think that Yossel arrives in Australia. Maybe I'll start a bit earlier. It's interesting to note that um, Yossel was born in 1920. Uh, Melech Ravage arrives here at age, uh, in 1933. So Yossel is then 13 and he's looking for a golden Medina here, for another country for the Jews to uh, rest their weary head, but Yossel bar mitzvah is without his father. Then Yossel um, arrives in 1937, and it's interesting to note that within a very short time, he was very well accepted by the painting community here, and became very, very accepted, and two years later, in 39, I think, Arthur Boyd and Noel Cunahan and Yossel have an exhibition at the Melbourne, uh, at the Melbourne University. Um, but during the time in Australia, Yossel painted a, a whole lot of different paintings, the, uh, but by and large, uh, they are of the social realist style. Uh, and. Um, Amongst them, and that's important to note here, he was the first one to paint Australian Aborigines, the, the uh, city dweller uh, Aborigines. In a way, they reminded him of the Jews of Warsaw, and that's the way he painted them. And it's interesting that years later, when he comes in 1990, with his uh, paintings um, uh, of the Aborigines, uh, of of Melech Ravage and the Aborigines, he paints in a very similar style to the style that he painted uh, uh, in Australia. 
they are much more social, in the social realist, they are much more accurate. And, but at the same time, if you go to those of you who bought the catalog, if not, you should, uh, no, not the catalog, the book, um, if you look at page 97, you will see the, the photograph which I think uh, inspired this painting. And it's interesting to see how he changed uh, in the photograph. It's a young Aborigine dressed in Western style. And here it is um, uh, 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 Aborigine. Um, um, in a very native, dressed in a native way and so on. Um, after Yossel uh, left Australia, he, he went to Israel and um, on the, no, arrived in Israel, I'm too old, uh, and uh, he painted in a variety of styles. Um, and uh, one of the main uh, one of the most interesting ways, uh, subject that he painted was the Kafka series. And in the Kafka series, I think he also identified with Kafka very, uh, very much in a number of ways. Uh, like Kafka, he had a very complicated relationship with his father. And he also kept going back and back to paint the Kafka series, and in fact, Yossel, who spoke wonderful Yiddish, which was his main language, and um, uh, was very uh, well read in English, um, but his Hebrew was very broken English. However, he invented wonderful words in Hebrew. One of them was lekafkev. Those who know, of you who know Hebrew, it's the pleasure of talking about Kafka. <laughs> and uh, he, all, he often talked about um, how um, his father translated Kafka's in the early 20s. Time? <laughs> uh, what shall I say? Uh, I want, to, in which case, just to congratulate Anna on this book. <laughs> And more importantly, uh, to say this, that uh, Yossel always wanted to get together with his father. He chased him around the world. And in this book, you brought the two of them together. And I'm sure Yossel would be very, very grateful for, to you for doing so. And so am I, and I hope all of us. And further, I think Yossel was a lover of the Yiddish language. And to have the celebration here in Kadima is particularly uh, appropriate. Thanks. Just before I introduce Anna, I wanted to do one thing, and that is there's a map of the language groups across Australia produced by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, it's impossible, really, to record all the different people who they must have met and engaged with. So I just wanted to give you a quick mental map. These are my language groups, so I'm doing my best here. But if you map their journey from Adelaide to Darwin, going from south to north, they travelled through the lands of the following people. The Kauna, the Nakunu, the Bangala, the Kokatha, the Arabana, the Arenti in Alice Springs, the Aliwari, the Ketej, the Waramungu, the Walmumpa, the Madbara, Waterman, Wagaman, Kungarakani, and of course the Larakia in Darwin. I was trying to come up with a way of introducing my auntie, um, but I realised it's a little bit like introducing uh, either of my parents, Jan or Joe. She has been such a fundamentally uh, positive and benevolent and stimulating part of my life. Like my parents, she's helped frame uh, the way that I look at the world. And it was just a beautiful thing to see her complete something like this book. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, Anna Epstein.
Thank you, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Guten Abend euch und seid begrüßt. It's marvelous, astonishing, really, to see so many of you here. You make my heart swell with gratitude. I'm touched to see faces here from my past, and I apologize in advance because I know I'm not going to have time for the talk I'd love to have with so many of you. A Groysen Dunk, big thanks to Rafi, Arnold, and Moshe, who've brought such color to this evening. I so enjoyed listening to you on my favorite subject. And to Tommy, who spontaneously agreed to play tonight and never fails to delight. I'm going to tell you the story of my infatuation with Melech Ravitch and how this book came to be written. Way back in 1991, when I was editing a publication for Multicultural Arts Victoria, an article was written for me by Rosa Safransky. If anyone knows how I can contact, aren't I clear? No. No. If anyone knows how I can contact Rosa, I'd be grateful. She's just lost to me. So this article was written about Melech Ravitch's crazy outback quest. With the article appeared the photograph of Ravitch and the young pipe-smoking woman in Darwin. It presented a strange, eccentric juxtaposition. He, the urbane cosmopolitan poet from Warsaw, in his bow tie, his pants hitched up nearly to his armpits. She, with aristocratic arms, he said, a representative of the oldest race on the planet. Together, they are leaning against the corrugated iron wall. The ground is dry and stony. This photograph was the spark that fired my imagination. It was one of 90 that Ravitch took on that journey, and his album, miraculously, was still in Melbourne. He'd left it with the famous Yiddishist, Sender Burston. Sender's sons, Ben, Morris and David, had been its custodians ever since. I am deeply grateful for the generosity of the Burston brothers, who entrusted me with the album. Another miracle has been the enlargement of its tiny box brownie photo. So these photos that you're looking at here were about that big technology so that we can look right into the detail and see what a courageous adventure Ravitch's was. In 1933, almost alone, on his own initiative, he crossed some of the world's most inhospitable terrain to look for a homeland for his people, whom he knew faced imminent annihilation. I wanted to tell the tale and to relate it to today's world refugee problem. I wanted to show the photographs. And as Ravitch's son, Jossel Bergner, had painted his father in the Australian desert, I had a doubly evocative opportunity to illustrate the story. There were actually 19 paintings called Melech Ravitch in the Kimberleys, although neither father nor son ever went to the Kimberley. <laughs> um, this is one of them. And I've found eight of them. If anyone knows where the others are, I'd be very, very grateful. That was the relatively simple beginning. But the more I looked into it, the more strands emerged. The joined story of Melech Ravitch and Jossel Bergner has everything. Two grand personalities, two remarkable men. Around their stories swirl social history, world history, even art history, as the young Bergner influenced Australia's most important painters in the early Heidi years. The capacious tale involves the Jews of Europe and the indigenous Australians, both threatened with genocide. In their different ways, Ravitch and Bergner saw the parallel between the two peoples, essentially the tragedy of displacement and dispossession. Ravitch's quest was on behalf of the dispossessed, 
and in Bergner's painting, he called himself a master of displacement. So, in the story, there is also the Holocaust, and there is the poignant struggle for the Yiddish language. There is the long search for a Jewish homeland, with the passionate battle between the territorialists and the Zionists. And there is the psychology of father and son, complicated souls in troubled, as Moshe said, Kafkaesque relationship to each other. On a wider canvas is the consideration of this country's greatest moral failures, our treatment of asylum seekers and of our indigenous population. This, in spite of our success as a multicultural society, which Australian Jews can certainly celebrate. Ravitch was a dreamer. Said Isaac Bashevis Singer, forgive the gendered language, Ravage believed with absolute faith that the world of justice could come today or tomorrow. All men would become brothers. There would be no Jews, no Gentiles, only a single united <coughs> mankind whose goal would be equality and progress. <coughs> In the book's epigraph, I quote Amos Oz saying the dreamers cannot save us. But I've changed my mind on this. As my friend Julia pointed out, it's the dreamers who effect revolutions, political and moral. Good and bad, of course, as history shows. <coughs> I think Ravitch's radical dreaming has a lot to teach us as we navigate our way through a world of unprecedented movements of homeless people. As he saw, we too can see the naked human need of refugees for permanent, safe shelter. There are many people who deserve my thanks for bringing this book to fruition. I must especially mention again the Burstons, because the photographs they safeguarded are the absolute centre of the book. Jossel Bergner died in 1917. His death seemed to chide me for not pulling my finger out earlier. Pardon? 2000. Did I say 1917? 100 years earlier, later. 2017. Thank you, Moshe. We wrote to each other and spoke on the phone, but I fervently wish we'd met so I could have thanked him in person for his generosity towards this project. I can thank his friends in Melbourne, Moshe Lang and Shaiki Sneer, who talked happily for hours about Yossel and lent me his artworks, as did others. I think talking to Moshe and talking to Shaiki about Yossel, I imagined that Yossel was like both Moshe and Shaiki and couldn't stop telling stories. It was just amazing. So both of those not only talked and talked and talked and talked, and so that I got to know Yossa without actually meeting him, but they lent me the art. And you'll see the vivid colour reproductions in the book, wonderfully bright work by Splitting Image. Thanks to Renata Singer and Helen Light, my first readers and my whips, it would have remained forever in the pipeline without you. Helen, when she was my beloved boss at the Jewish Museum, taught me that you can never thank people too much. So it's due to her that you must listen to this last part of my speech. <laughs> thank you to my family who have never balked at sponsoring me, especially my lifelong rock, my brother Joseph, his ever generous wife Jan, and my honest and loving sons, Jake and Dan, supporting me in every way as does my mate, my lover, Ray, a mensch in all senses, who provides every sort of haven for my body and soul. My friends Althea, Suzanne, Kathy, Anne and Robbie were conscientious readers whose ideas improved my writing and helped to sort out my thinking. Melbourne's Yiddishists were inspiring, as usual. Dudi and Danielle contributed translation and this marvellous institution, the Kadima, 
where the launch has been organised by yet another burst and Morris's daughter Faye, who has worked so hard to make it a success. By the way, there's still so much I'd like to learn about Malach Ravitch, so I'm waiting for a Yiddishist out there to do a PhD, translating some of his enormous oeuvre into English. Now to the publication. I chose Real Film and Publishing because they make beautiful books and what a perfect choice it was. Romy Mashinsky and Georgie Reich Allen guided the book through its multiple iterations. Not a calm or easy process. We were opinionated women and we had arguments over many things, but particularly over Malik Ravitch's colonial era racism which horrified them. I saw it as part of a complex, sometimes ignorant, but unusually benign web of perceptions. We reached an accommodation. <laughs> then the designer Trisha Gardner worked her, Garner worked her magic and we have such a beautiful book as a result. The text you shall have to judge for yourselves. <laughs> now, heartfelt thanks to you all once again for coming. Eat, Drink and be merry, take pleasure in each other's company and enjoy the book. <laughs>